So just a few words first um, about what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to refer to a survey of uh, film blur forms uh, showing overlaps with pink body or photographic uh, styles. And to a certain extent, as on that elsewhere, but today in keeping with the spirits of uh, with the spirit spirits, uh, the spirit of l'entremage, I would like to talk about the in-betweenness of uh, cinema, photography, and video. Um, right, so I'm going to start with a few images, and when I say a few, it's really a few seconds, uh, from uh, Ziga Bertos, a man with the camera, so you will recognize these images uh, immediately, uh, where uh, Vertov uh, demonstrates how the lens uh, controls, determines um, our uh, perception. <coughs> All right, so common understanding uh, associates the superiority of machine lens-based vision with a greater accuracy and definition than that of the human eye. Yet, as Vertov's demonstration illustrates, if there is one visual effect that the eye of the camera can recall better than the human eye, then it is in fact blur. Except in cases of myopia or in seeing through the pattern glass, uh, the human eye constantly adjusts and filters. As Raymond Bellour uh, stresses in one passage on motion blur in uh, L'Entre Image, that which the human eye does not normally register is blurredness. Whether it is the blurredness of bodies in motion, of objects far away, at the margins of the field of vision, or in the very close proximity. But film and photography do. Indeed, further than photography, the film image, as it unfolds in time, not only has the power to record blur, but also to capture, to capture it as a visible manifestation of in-betweenness. As far as film form is concerned, to talk about blur's in-betweenness is an evidence. Blur's dominion lies between that of the precise, well-controlled image and abstraction, between identifiable sound and indistinct rumor in the spatio-temporal interval that extends between stillness and movement, in the perceptual shift of the visual towards the tactile. In turn, however, Blur's formlessness facilitates the kind of in-betweenness I wish to consider here. In-betweenness as Raymond Bellour and in turn Agnès Petho understand and describe it, that is, as a fluctuating zone of exchange between images across techniques and across mediums. In between an S in this sense equally applies to the two intertwined axes that normally frame the definitions of medium. It may serve to describe the exchanges that takes place that take place as a crossbreeding of diverse media images, or to describe the reconfiguration of the technology and dispositif that condition their production, display, and reception. To approach film blur within this framework is to shun its reduction to mere accessory to the defined image. In other words, blur is not to be envisaged here simply from the point of view of the traditional narrative cinema's grammar, as a defect or as a compositional trope, a momentary lapse into indefinition between two sequences of clear and defined images, or a backdrop against which the intended object of attention stands out in full focus. Nor is blur reducible to the kind of transitional effect developed as part of narrative towards conventions, the fade in, the fade out, the dissolve, or indeed as a stylistic effect aiming to deflect the mechanistic nature of the medium or to give the image an authentic raw feel, as um, in the soft style cinematography or in handheld camera mode respectively. Although these elements necessarily come into play in what follows, they are but one dimension of film blur. As underscored by Vertov and Bellour, before and beyond its narrative and artistic uses, blur is intrinsic to the medium's ability to better the human eye, to extend the frontiers of human perception. And it is in this sense that it is a favored site of passages between images and mediums. 
Um, and we could understand uh, in that way, we could understand Brewer um, in the same way that Giorgio uh, Agamben in some of his texts on potentiality um, uses obscurity as one of his examples. He says obscurity is not just experienced as the absence of light. We experience obscurity in itself. And in the same way, you could say that blur is not just the absence of definition, we experience it um, in itself. Um, equally, blur therefore may be envisaged here as a manifestation of what Walter Benjamin called the optical unconscious, the potentiality for technologies to bring to the surface a vision of the world that has, um, because so far it escaped standard human perception, remained in the collective unconscious. To explore blur as the quintessence of in-betweenness, therefore, is to approach it first and foremost as a manifestation of the plasticity and endless becoming of the film image. It is as such that blur opens the film image to the fluctuations and exchanges that Bellot calls l'entrimage, where images produced by one specific medium bear witness to its porosity to and closeness with other medium. Another medium. In turn, blur may serve as a marker that points to the parallel and combined evolution across media of the conditions of production, but also the display and circulation of moving images. In the first instance, I would like to consider the ways in which, in certain instances of blur, cinema images are haunted by the images of another medium, one that pre-exists cinema, is emergent or is yet to be invented. In this context, the in-betweenness of blur bears similarities with George Ghibli Huberman's concept of the symptom image. For Didi Huberman, symptom images testify to the existence of an underside of visual representation, where, I quote, seemingly intelligible forms lose their clarity and defy rational understanding. For Didi Huberman, the experience of symptom images is fundamentally anachronistic. The way such images draw on the spectator's memory exceeds art history's categories and its chronological account of styles and techniques. I would argue that symptom images are, maybe more appropriately, in the case of a time-based medium, instances of hauntings of one medium by another, as they manifest themselves through the liminal zones of the blurred image participate in the deployment of what Jacques called cinema's power of apparition, pouvoir d'apparition. The reason I'm translating it literally here, apparition, uh, rather than say appearance, is because Omo uses the term apparition in the double meaning in French at the cross between the spirit and the process of making visible. For him, film draws this unequal ability from its quality as a time-based medium that performs the process of visual materialization. As Oman puts it, I quote, what distinguishes film images from all the other images is, of course, that they vary in time and that they have the, gen the generic power to appear in front of my eyes. He says, and I quote it in italics, to appear and not simply to make something appear. Or, as he puts it later, the figural, envisaged from the point of view of cinema's power to make things appear, is the capacity of the image, I quote, to make us see and not simply to let us see. In my first example, traces of the photographic uh, thus participate in cinema's staging of its own power of appearance or of, appear of, of apparition. Amongst a number of possibilities, I chose the famous scene of Judy's transformation in Madeleine in Hitchcock's Vertigo. Now, it's a somewhat risky choice, because what can one ever say? What more can one say about these much, much discussed images? Um, and yet, um, uh, this sequence imposed itself on me, as it were, not only for the way it exploits and dramatizes cinema's power of visualization, but also for its double haunting. The contouring up of a dead woman's silhouette, that is also, I argue, a contouring up of film's origins as a photochemical medium. In its use in its uses of blur, Hitchcock's cinematography often adhered to conventional narrative functions, transparency, dissolved, myopic or hallucinatory points of view abound in his films. 
In contrast, what made this sequence famous is, of course, the way the progression from blurredness to definition gives form, literally, to the pool of desire, um, collapsing it with scopic vision, the desire to see and possess through the gaze.
In Vertov's film, the landscape transformation of the flowers is complemented by the work of the editor. As you recall, in Man with a Camera, the filming of the editor handling and cutting strips of photograms serves as a reminder of the art of film as an art of time, a specific cinematic time, linear or aberrant, fluid or halting, slow or speedy up. In contrast, many a film historian and film theorist has stressed continuity, immediacy, and instantaneity as the main characteristic of the electronic mass media image. Hence, Belou, for instance, observed how in his mass media treatment, I quote, history finds itself reduced to an inconsistent present, always renewed but relative, evanescent. For, and I quote Belou again, the electronic image makes it possible to construct an instantaneous and virtually infinite double of reality. Of course, the majority of films is now shot digitally, yet that distinction between the televised of web webcasted through of uh, present tense images and the circumscribed yet complex non-linear cinematic type has remained. Granted, granted sorry, talk of the new frenzy of the visible, to use uh, uh, Comoli's uh, very evocative expression, ushered in by the ubiquitous presence of the electronic and later the digital image has become a bit of a tired cliché. Within this contemporary regime of imaging, however, where our reality appears to generate almost instantaneously its own spectral doubles, very different from the uh, spirits of old, the blurred image arguably offers itself as a locus of perceptual uncertainty that defies immediacy. Issuing the instantaneous consumption of images made possible by their immediate legibility, blur allows for the in-betweenness of the image to manifest itself instead. At the same time, as a key instance of what Hito Scheyer called the poor image, the circulating, copied, refilled, compressed, reformatted, faded, and pixelated image, Blur carries with it the chaotic rumors of an endlessly communicating world. Writing at the beginning of the 20th century, so before the advent of uh, abstraction, the historian Wilhelm Voringer suggested that in representation, the drive to abstract objects from the surrounding matter corresponds to the desire to make sense of or to deny the pool, the existence and the pool of chaos. Abstraction, in his use of the term, has nothing to do with non-figurative art. Wollinger is interested in the meaning of techniques of representation where objects are isolated or extracted from the backdrop, uh, contoured and demarcated, so as to be presented in a more stable and legible manner. As Neil Donohue puts it, Wollinger points to the existential grounding of a particular aesthetic inclination. For Wollinger, Donahue argues, I quote, the urge for abstraction takes root in an awareness of temporality, contingency, and a state of abject terror, the immense dead of space and the contingency of happening. The kind of abstraction Wollinger described is arguably at work today in the search for ever higher definition images including 3D images. On the one hand, blurred aesthetics offer a resistance to this regime of the hyper-visible. But in addition to paraphrase the Huberman, blur has always been a part of art's function or fate to give visibility to an underside of visual representation that surfaces also in popular culture. Horror cinema, of course, has been quick to see the potentiality offered by the new regimes of imaging in generating the kind of abject terror described by Donahue. Horror cinema is permeated with other images, blood, glitch, colonized by noise, and generated by an increasingly automated and seemingly self-operating set of technologies of audiovision. A number of experimental and of art filmmakers, of course, have also sought to explore the underside of visual representation, focusing in particular on the vulnerability of the human figure within a fluctuating audiovisual field devoid of a stable, centralizing compositional logic. 
My following example is extracted from Harmony Corrine's 1995 dogma film, Julian Donkey Boy. Corrine's interest in exploring possibilities afforded by the small handheld digital camera is clearly inflected by his sensitivity to the diverse effects of the regime of imaging born out of the old and new technologies. We may describe the main character of Corinne's film, Julian, uh, Julian, as a schizophrenic man, unless that is we envisage the film itself as schizophrenic. Its images doomed to manifest the spectral nature of electronic and digital imaging the experience of uh, reality as its chaotic dollar. The extract I will show is from the very beginning of the film, though, um, and uh, though later transferred to 35mm, um, throughout the film, the digital video image, recorded without the help of extra light, filter, and the void of post-production effects, displays the strong contrast over sensitive changes of light, the bleeding colors, and the, um, the effect of uh, remanence, I'm looking for the term in English, uh, the traces that bodies in motion leave um, on low definition video images. The first sequence is a slowed down shot of a television screen. Contrary to the fluid effect of uh, slow motion based on overpranking, uh, Corinne chooses to play the images back at a lower rate than the recording ones, hence the um, irregular flow of the images, a halting effect that has less to do with the memory of photography, I would say, um, than with the technique of video instant replay, just as the ice skater circling motion um, arguably gestures less towards early film and pre-cinematic media um, than uh, towards electronic and digital uh, short forms and loops. And yet, for all their derivative origin and treatment, Corinne does not shy from, sat from saturating this enigmatic sequence of images with a strong sense of pathos, setting its shaky, precarious looking images to the music of a famous Puccini area. Aria, should I say? Sorry. <laughs> um, we then uh, will discover for a few, uh, uh, for a few moments um, Julian, the main, ca main character walking uh, in an undergrowth. The camera lens at that point appears unable to hierarchize the information that reaches its digital sensors. Contours and colors dissolve, the foreground and the background appear alternately blur blurred or defined, or they seem to merge the human figure caught in the turbulence of an unstable visual field. In effect, Throughout the film, expressed through the low def definition digital image, unselective, oversensitive to light and motion, the character's internal and external vision appear fused, as in a terrifying process of unfiltered affect. Oh, <laughs> 
So in Collins' feature, the fusion of different regimes of oops, sorry. In Collins' feature, um, the fusion of different regimes of imaging, television, video, cinema, results in an hystericized representation of a uh, paroxystic sensibility that may be also pointing towards the spectral logic of today's over-mediatized reality. Yet, Corinne's choice of music for the opening sequence of Julian Donkey Boy is a reminder that no matter its material support, and in this case the recording of a digital uh, video camera, cinema remains the most operatic of all mediums, able to integrate other forms of expression into its cinematic worlds. In contrast, installation art, the most emblematic of art forms in the era of the so-called post-medium condition, operates primarily as a restaging of existing mediums and of their images. To summarize the expansive literature on the topic since the advent of the digital, one could simply point out when it concerns itself with cinema, television and the moving image generally, installation art tends to investigate and reconfigure their technical or aesthetic constituents, their supporting structure and or aesthetic conventions, and in doing so, in laying bare some of the conditions of their differentiation and in betweenness. Uh, and it is in this context, as Bellemo puts it, that video, he says, is essentially a go-between, une passeuse. I'm interested in the way the blurred image and its specific, specific modes of in-betweenness may function in this context. And to this end, I would like to conclude with an installation work by André Parenti, in, entitled The Chronic Wound. It was created in collaboration with his son, the video artist Lucas Parenti. They described the work, I quote, as a synthesis of video installation and film essay. Um, so the uh, image of a full-size man, as you can see here, a full-size man asleep, is projected on a mattress. The mattress is, co is covered with the kind of patterned fabric sometimes described as colonial fabric. The motifs are from the work of a French painter, Jean-Baptiste Jean Debré, an artist who traveled to Rio in the early 19th century. So he was a Bonapartist. At the head of the mattress, on a smallish TV-like screen, we see chaotic, blurred, partly obscured images of slums or demonstrations. Um, the voiceover features a dialogue between a man's voice speaking of the heat and of the oppressive presence of a city compared to a decomposing corpse, and a woman's voice, a personification of the city maybe, evoking through a litany of facts and figures Rio's 1904 revolt of the vaccine. Associated with the recurrent mention of vultures in the dialogue as well as on the smaller screen, the vaccinating form of the prone body evokes an endless cycle of appearances and disappearances set against the backdrop of official histories that erase the bodies that do not fit in their account. So I'm going to try and um, access... So I should say this is a montage of images showing on both screens, so the sleeping man and the TV screen.
calor é um conceito da era científica. Ele não recobre outra coisa que o conceito mítico de caos. O calor é o nosso caos. O fogo é uma agitação de miríades. Agitação de moléculas num fluxo informe. Hoje sonhei com grupos. Pássaros enormes que desciam girando para me devorar. Tinha olhos grandes de humanos. Eram, na verdade, pessoas vestidas de pássaros. As aves catartidiformes da família dos catartídeos têm os dedos livres, dispostos três para diante e um par para trás, pernas mais ou menos curtas, base do bico coberta de uma cera peculiar, cabeça nua. O urubu de cabeça preta realiza voos planados a grandes alturas, aproveitando as correntes ascendentes de ar quente para se locomover sem gastar grandes quantidades de energia. Tal atitude econômica se deve à alimentação necrófaga, pois os urubus devem expelir uma grande quantidade de suco gástrico para digerir seu alimento, constituído de carcaças de animais, frutas e outras matérias em decomposição encontradas em depósitos de lixo. So, um, so yes, so this is a montage, obviously, as you saw in the installation shots, uh, you have one image projected on the floor and then the uh, small screen at the head of the mattress, as it were. Um, so two regimes of the blurred image are laid side by side um, here. There's the softly textured of the uh, image of the sleeping man, but the succession of dissolves and does with an organic feel. <laughs> The sleeping body's rhythmical appearance and appearances and disappearances make it look as if the image itself was breathing. Parenthes' choice of the dissolve, a potent tool in the service of the moving image's power of appearance or power of apparition, draws on a long tradition of association of blur with sleep and dream states. In a neat visual translation of the Cartesian doctor, in cinema, the clear and distinct image usually indicates a state of awakened awareness, whereas very early on in the history of the medium, the blurred image has signaled a shift into a state of dreaminess or unconsciousness. Next to the projected image of the sleeping man, the small screen is animated by an uninterrupted flow of lurid visions, even more threatening that they remain partly illegible. Uh, unfolding endlessly on the screen without a clear rational or narrative. Andre and Lucas Parente work, Parente's work thus speaks of the difficulty in assigning a source of enunciation to images today as they float our screens and, and this might go a, a tiny way in engaging with the discussion that took place after uh, Thomas and Lisser's uh, talk yesterday. Um, for Vivian Subchak, writing in the scene on the screen, the uh, partly automated mass production of, circula of circulation of images today um, in that kind of semi-automated mass production of images, if you like, the loss of the kind of visible dispositive and grammar of the cinema gives way to unencored images, often images without a, start, uh, without a stated point of view for which no one takes responsibility. As we have seen, however, André and Lucas Parente's work, with its dialogue in two voices and dual mode of screening, the projection coupled with a lens in the screen, presents us with two regimes of the blurred image. The two kinds of images generate their own characteristic sense of hapticity, born out of a profusion of detail and subtle variations on the one hand, or on the contrary, by a partial obliteration of blotting of contours that draws the figures towards formlessness. Passages between the two happen through the gaze of the spectator, going from one to the other or embracing both at the same time. The capacity to engage with both differently and to acknowledge their cohabitation or coexistence 
as the mark also of the continuing coexistence of different regimes and technologies uh, of imaging is, I believe, key. And I would like to conclude by suggesting that in betweenness, as a foregrounding of the complexity and diversity of images, is to reference Zobchak again, um, who writes both the terms I'm about to mention as two words with a dash. Um, so as a foregrounding of the complexity and diversity of images, it is what helps us develop our sense ability and in turn our response ability. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Martin, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, topic and wonderful examples. And uh, <clears throat> if you have any questions uh, to Martin, this is the time uh, uh, to have a uh, discussion. It's uh, blur is a figure of becoming. It's the image in uh, in fluctuation. Uh, so it's not fixed into abstraction. It might go as far as near abstraction. It might go as far as near definition. But it is neither. And it's its faculty to be really what Agamben calls potentiality. That is uh, the denial of being the fixed either or the being in between as an affirmation of in betweenness. That is important, I think, in a in a differentiation between what abstract images do and what blurred ones can do. Uh, if that. Yeah, you you wouldn't say the same for abstract art. It's a process of becoming as well. Um. Um, in this film, for example, you have that kind of abstraction that leads into. Figurative and figurative kind of, well, perhaps the blur, well, perhaps the, the blur can signify it. My, my impression when modern art that tended towards abstraction was also a means of uh, leaving behind the, the definition towards something else, towards that, something that requires uh, the viewer's um, active participation in making sense of giving another form that wasn't there before. So I don't know, but anyway, yes, it's, so perhaps now with the digital, this thing acquires a different meaning. Yeah. But especially <coughs> impressions, that it gives to my mind, where you have to move, where you have to move mm -hmm. uh, in early impression painting, so you have to move, it's not the lens that makes the tradition, but if you move far away, then you have a more precise um, sorry, I didn't hear. I think there is a question. Yes, all right, I, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, thank you for this incredibly thought provoking lecture. I'm still trying to process all the things you're saying, but there, there are two preliminary remarks that occur to me. Um, do I understand you right that for you, blur uh, is in some sense an act of resistance? When you quoted uh, Ito Steyer, who very much sees the poor image as an act of resistance. And uh, in which case, uh, I was wondering whether there isn't a continuum in our perception, because for cognitivists, uh, human perception doesn't need a lot of information, because most of it is computated in the brain. In other words, that there isn't actually a radical distinction 
between us um, seeing an image and then working out what it is and a blurred image where we then go to the nearest default value of what we remember or what we already know. So in that case, it wouldn't actually be a binary opposition, uh, but more one aspect of a continuum that constantly involves us uh, adding information to our visual field. And the other remark is that uh, I'm, I'm interested in, as it were, the opposite, namely high frame rate um, um, photography or cinematography. And I remember uh, a film by uh, Ian Ang, no, sorry, uh, Ang Lee, uh, called uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but that was shot at a high frame rate in order to represent trauma. And um, it's, it would be interesting to think about high frame rate, which is uh, digital precision plus, and uh, blur digital precision minus. And both of them have a disorienting effect on our way of perceiving the world. Yes, I agree. I mean, it's uh, another way of, uh, another way to exceed, in other words, uh, uh, kind of uh, normal uh, human perception, if we can call it that. So that's, that's right. Um, um, and um, as far as your um, first uh, comment is, I mean, blur can be a resistance to the hyper-visible. I'm not saying it always is, uh, but it, it can be. And so I would say that uh, it has been precious, uh, I think, in, uh, um, in the run to uh, ever higher definition images. I mean, yeah. and to put it very bluntly, we've all been in uh, you know, uh, uh, shops where you're surrounded by screens that will advertise themselves as high definition. And, you get this really quite awful sets of images, uh, and in that uh, blur, blurness has been a relief. Uh, it's also the connection of cinema to experimental forms, to a whole kind of like tradition of image making that uh, needs to be uh, uh, kept alive if you want to keep the diversity of um, of images. And I'm completely forgetting for forgetting where I'm going. Um, but uh, but yes, cognitivism. Um, it's interesting. I'm, 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 you know, I'm not sure how far um, cognitivist experiment with uh, uh, face recognition, in particular, is concerned. For instance, but at the moment, they still have a, a, a lot of difficulties uh, really identifying uh, faces and identifying expressions unless they get a high definition of an image. So we, uh, when we perceive uh, other people, uh, might not need a lot of information, and that's the difference between. Um, uh, uh, human perception and uh, what is needed for collecting data. But um, uh, I know that for, to have for, for, for having worked with people who work with um, uh, in computer sciences who work, for instance, with surveillance images, that it's very difficult a lot of the time to recognize anybody still on uh, surveillance camera footage. Um, and so I think again, in, in the case of representation, their blur is uh, a kind of a precious mode of relief, I would say, uh, from, uh, from that, that, that kind of uh, tendency, that kind of trend. Thank you for your very rich talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know how relevant it is to, I mean, it is relevant, but I don't know, um, I mean, it's a bit apart from what you were talking about. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I came across an article about Gerhard Richter, and as you know, he tries to achieve with painterly means an approximation of the blur effect in, um, in painting, uh, so photographic effect in painting and I remember that article was making the point that one could think of the blur as um, a sort of idiomatic aspect of the film or photographic language meaning something that is ultimately untranslatable um, with other means um, so I was wondering whether you had any thoughts about that or what whether you had any thoughts about Gerhard Richter's practice with reference to blur yes Yes, if you're uh, familiar with uh, Charlie Goddard's slow motion, 
there's a lot of Richter like kind of uh, effect uh, in slow motion. In fact, Richter um, uh, says very eloquent things about uh, all forms of blur, but there's one which I uh, really like uh, in one interview where he says, uh, We do not see less in blur, we see more. Um, and I think that kind of sums up what he's trying to do.